Hello everyone, let's see, am I starting on time? I think I am, goodness gracious me. Hello Joshua Peters, hello Jack Hunter, hello Sean Mack, Halbert Albert Zaski, and Angus O'Sonnell, hello! Turns out, you were first today. Nice to see you all, I hope there are a few others coming along. It's always fun to have more people. Hello Aviator 1701 e I did have a very productive week. I hope you enjoyed all the videos today. That's part of the productive week. <laughs> Hello, Stafford Thompson. Hello, DGV40. Yes, I did have a good day. I hope you had a good day as well. Um, share. Copy. Let's go to the Discord. I'm just going to go. It's a fun time. So, hello, Michael Rose. Hello, Derp Squad. Incoherent gibberish with occasional reference to needing a naval history fix. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there have been a few comments about me going off on holiday, me having a you know holiday and time. So, it was a research week, and it was actually quite a good one because it allowed me to get ahead on a few projects and get some writing done for the Falklands 40 anniversary book I'm writing. Well, when I say I'm writing, my girlfriend and I all ran a conference on the Falklands uh, called FM37, which was all about the Falklands War, brought together historians, uh, servicemen who are veterans and some current, and journalists and everyone from both sides, as, as much as we could, in Manchester to do a conference. And from that has come a chaptered edited book which my girlfriend and I are putting together and getting everyone to sort of write together and sort out that. And we're also, do, I'm also doing, writing a chapter, I was also writing a chapter for another book, which is going to be published elsewhere on Falklands. And um, I've been getting ahead on another book project and trying to turn my PhD into a book and get my PhD sorted out. So it's finally done public a uh, nice and publicly available and downloadable as it's supposed to be but that has you know all cleared and all sorted out and that's still taking time and i've got to get it rebound and resorted out apparently oh more money everything's always more money isn't it that that's the way did the world is meant the world just keeps going more money more money more money um yeah i'll get for it somehow but no, on the plus side, courtesy of the lovely Anne and Eric, my girlfriend's mum and dad, thank you. Very nice. And lunch today was courtesy of my mum, who basically decided that I'd forgotten to eat two days in a row lunch, and she wasn't having it happen the third day in a row, so lunch got put in front of me. Yes, I am a workaholic, and I admit this. Hi, Martin Duck. Angus how did the video formats feel for you making them? Are you enjoying the two minutes? I think I am enjoying the two minutes. Basically, I treat the two minutes as what can I say about one particular thing of a slide, a slide panel in that two minutes. I don't try and do too much. And the thing is, because I know I'm doing a, I'm going to be doing introductions and they or long patrols, and I'm going to be doing alive i can really just go i can focus that down on which does give me a slight advantage over drac in that regard because he puts it tries to put everything into his five minutes and i love him for his dedication to it but i honestly couldn't stand the stress so the fact is i know that i can say as much as i can in two minutes but i have a nice long one that anything that doesn't go in there well i can just go check the long one check the long one check the long one and it makes my life a little easier. 
Um, Stafford Thompson, Dr. Clark, has been productive, got half the new beam in her home and working on the other portion of lunch. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Hello, Jay Rishon. Hi, Carl von Kasberg. Hello, Dunkirk uh, Dunrick Ironhammer. Late, three, five minutes on one half, one point quarter and quarter times catch up. I was asking, Drax Simon, this is like five plus ten to fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, like, no more iron brew trips. I, I tri uh, research trips. I mean, iron brew ships. <laughs> uh, I think the next ones are all structured around not actually being away on a Sunday. So, yeah, you you won't lose out on brew ships. Derp Squad, the worst for no more money, uh, for more money are academic journals. No cost for the articles, no cost for editing, no cost for reviewing the articles, minimum publication costs, now it's online. 40 quid for 48 hours you. Yep. Um, that is... Mm -hmm. uh, so far, the only journals I have been entertaining publishing with are both the BCMH Journal and Marine du Nord, which are both free to view. Um, I like them. I do like them. They are good journals, and they have good content. <sighs> My God, is that such a move? Right. So today's fun. Patron seven, how the RN counted uh, counted e boats in the English Channel, as proposed by Paul. So this is one of those patron videos, and I do like those. As you'll notice, there I do have also started making a point of if you've gone through the admin video I put up about uh, September and October videos of making a point when the videos come from Discord as well, so you see which ones do come from Discord. I have to say there are two more ideas which are inspired by Discord, but people actually write those topics up there. It's just I was looking at the topics and went, yeah, I'd like to do something around that, but I don't like that question at all. And so I'm completely rewriting it because I fancy doing it from a different perspective. Or in one case, I'd love to do it, but I think that would be about a 12-hour live. <laughs> Raparoso, I get everyone needs to get paid, but books, especially new ones, are expensive. They are. Hello, Jay Ingmuff. Good evening to all. Hope everyone has good health. I do, too. Ren, so. The first thing, and this is the first thing you always have to remember when we are talking about e-boats. Is that really, if we're being honest, they are used as a catch-all cover to cover R boats and Elbings and all sorts of things which the Germans were producing, which were get used in that role. E boats are the prominent ones, but it, as I said, I think in one of the recorded videos, they're kind of like the Spitfires. They suck up all the attention in the Battle of Britain in popular history, in quite a lot of popular history and these sort of things, when actually, when you look into it, the Hurricanes are doing a lot of the work as well, if not most of the work. With the e-boats, they are doing a lot of the work, so it's not quite the same parable as the Spitfire, but it's the closest one I could really think of. Hi, Daniel Freeman. That squad. Depends on the book. And anything niche, you end up paying more just because of the short, uh, short print run. Yes. Jepila, hello, afternoon, just here for a bit. Peter Dickens is my favourite source for this topic. He is very, very good and a lot of fun. Now, what was I going to quickly do? Oh, yes.
to remind myself. I've put a little note to remind myself to go back and add in the timestamps, which I normally do in these things. So. Mmm. Rapid Rose back. How to deal with e boats? Small boat plus fast boat plus 40 millimeter plus 20 millimeter plus 30 cal plus 50 cal. And one, uh, of, an, uh, one of an angry tri uh, 50 cal en masse. Think baby tribal. Pretty much. Oliver Pike. Now that Drac is selling the uh, painting of the FAA aircraft, you should commission one of an angry tribal in Narvik, <laughs> like Eskimo reversing to sell. That is tempting. Uh, that is tempting. I have to say, I will need to get involved with someone who is far more better with um, far better with their artistic talent than me. But you know, we might get into so many things. Sam Thompson, rapper is like, expensive books to me is equal to teach someone to fish theory. Ah. To an extent. By someone else. Hello, everyone. Hello. Dirt Squad. I'm wondering if the RN ever played the idea of putting a jet turbine in a motor gunboat. Look at some of the post World War II Vosper designs. Uh, Calm Gasbert. And I had to stop the introduction for your 33 minutes, so I do not know whether it connects to yes, the World War One Interactive. <laughs> not quite, but. You keep going on about the World War One Adriatic. You be careful what you wish for. You might not find yourself getting something so coming on there, Carl. Jermak, rapid race back. We probably get into this later, but dog boats now after introduction seem to me like micro destroyers. Yeah, as I was trying to make the point in the summary, there is well, if you consider originally how the Royal Navy and we'll get onto this as we go through the Royal Navy is dealing with torpedo boats as posed by the French and the Russians. They develop torpedo boat destroyers. Destroyers move up, move up, move up, and become far bigger anti-submarine general purpose assets, still able to take out torpedo boats, but big ocean-going vessels. So basically, I would argue that the motor gunboat is the Royal Navy reinventing the torpedo boat destroyer. And basically going, right then, we have to deal with this problem. Ah, we have a solution. Let's build it. And that's pretty much what they do. But that really does a bridge everything, and we're going to get into this. Jermak. We probably get uh, done, done that. Rapid race back. I'm not saying books should be free. Felix B. The steamboats are my favourite. They are cute. The fact that there was only so few produced of them has made me really... And there's one still surviving as a houseboat. I, I I would like to get it someday, once the person who's probably currently living it no longer needs it, I would love to have a museum take it over and turn it back to its original thing so it looks proper, applied to place. Hello, Stephanie Wilson. Reparation work. How to deal with e-boats. Dr. Clark's 40 millimeter closed the system. Yeah, that would work. Seth Thompson, me either rapid, uh, uh, rapid, just saying everything has a value for a reason. Hmm. Carl Harmon, uh, today is getting better and better. Free high quality videos for you, then alive, then finally being told I'm back to work next week. Only downside is one day, one day a week for the winter. Hmm. Still better than uh, you know. The thing is, I my view is always it's it's better than nothing. We always would like more, but there again, I am a worker. As I said, I'm a workaholic. Don't turn into me. It's really not good. Uh, Felix B. But 12 knots, they could just arm the pleasure paddles with lots of guns. Uh, a lot of, of, of guns. They did do that. Uh, but they were mainly turned into AA ships, because they were very stable. Today is... Uh, let's see. Vice Admiral Nelson, was there a World War II allied design using the Lursen effect as well? I think there was. What was the effect of radar? Very cool. We're going to get into all this. Uh, Rapid race e boat equals PT boat. Mm, to an extent. My dog, Dr. Clark, was Border and Brave not powered by gas turbines? I think they were. Come, it is, but uh, uh, and more is good. Seth Thompson, Dr. Clark, a lotto, a lotto winning portion would convince many people to move on. I'm still playing when I can. Mm. Right then. Jeff Wheeler, are we looking at Moto ASWs? I believe the early MG, MGBs were converted to ASWs. The early ones were Fairmile Bs, mostly converted, and Fairmile Bs could be used for anti submarine warfare, anything. There were a few other little boats as well, and that's why the first book, before we get into much, and I start going through the context and geography, 
just get my notes from the Battle of the Shant out of the way, is this one, okay? So, it has an entire chapter at the back. Well, chapter 12. There's still 13 and 14 to go <laughs> in this thing. What I love is it has auxiliary airships and all sorts of things hidden in here. So, you have Fairmile A's, B's, C's, and D's. You have da -da 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 -da. Uh, the French CH forty one classes, which were taken up. The BPP, uh, the BPP type nineteen forty, which was supposed to be anti submarine warfare and turned out not to be that good at that. You have Higgins type nineteen forty one. Uh, BPP type 1941, BPP, uh, BPB type 1942, Vosper type 1, type 2, type 1940, type 1941, type 1942, type 1943, type 1944, uh, BPEB type 1944. The Elko 70s, Elko 80s, I have said Fairmile D's, these, and um, the HDMLs. There are a lot of small boats produced, okay? We've uh, As with trawlers, as with everything, because there needs to be a lot. There does need to be a lot. So, first things first, the first. The context and geography of the English Channel. The raw, uh, Britain has always worried about an invasion from the sea. Pretty much every time it's had a major problem, it has been caused by someone getting over the sea. This is why traditionally the Royal Navy is the senior service and is invested in quite heavily. We don't have a land border as long as Scotland is still part of us. When Scotland wasn't part of us, that was when there was a lot of problems in the north as well. But they keep everything working to keep that sea border as strong as possible. The trouble is, the faster ships get, the quicker it gets to cross. And one of the interesting stats that comes up with the small boats, it's one of the requirements, is that they be able to cross to the other side, to one side, uh, to the French coast, operate there, and cross back within a night. So they have to be fairly fast. And I expect to operate there for a couple of hours. So they want to keep them going there in the hours of darkness. Not just in winter darkness, but in summer darkness as well. This requires them to be fast. There's also the fact that the channel itself covers 29,000 square miles, roughly. That's a lot of area to try and deal with, especially pre-radar. Even with radar, it's complicated and annoying. So, come, uh, Doctor, I work, work six days, seven days a week, so I mean, I, I, I am already. Ouch. Yeah. Come, how did the e-boats get into the D-Day practices? Surely they should have been given good defense against them. The thing is, the British were trying to give as many defenses against them, but also to... It's going to sound strange. The D-Day practices, especially the ones, I say, Clinton close to D-Day, also were suffering from limitations in terms of numbers available because a lot of ships were down for long maintenance and upgrade, I making sure they had radar fitted, the best guns, all the engines greased up and working, all those things, because Britain knew it was going to be a maximal effort once D-Day itself was in progress. And there are failures. There are lots of humans in the chain, and mistakes happen. It's annoying. We'll get into that as we go on. Martin Doc, never heard anything after fair, mail, or fair miles, just noise. Hmm, that's strange. Wonder why. Turn up the volume a bit. Uh... Let's see. 
Felix B. After the war, the German counter piston diesels used, uh, used gave Napier the idea for the Delta engines. The insane British diesels. Yes. Rapid race back. UK needs a bigger moat. Yeah, we'd always like to. Sean Brennan. No land on border. Ireland disagrees. That, that, I was going to leave that to one side, okay? We're going to leave that, park that issue for the moment. All right. That's a whole nother pain area. Speaking with family who... Broadly speaking, both sides of that, yeah. It's kind of like the Scott a lot of Loch Ness Monster. I do not go anywhere near that issue. Uh, Jerison, to what extent were sloops, corvettes, frigates used as torpedo boat destroyers? Anything could be used as a torpedo destroyer if that was a, if that was what was required. They were all available as part of the escorts of the convoys, and they would all be armed as much as they could. Go on, Why e-boat when the Germans called them Schnell boats? Because that is the Allied designation of them. And as this particular video is concentrating on how the British and the British especially counted them and thought about them. In order to be true to sort of that period, I'm calling them by the, the name which the British gave them at the time, which was an e-boat. Angus Sonnen, York is just so tempting of a place to visit on holiday for the Scots. Very hard to resist going there when it's an international water. Uh, yeah. uh, Gone Eagle, shouldn't it be S-boat? Well, that's a trouble. That the S-boats were also sometimes used for the submarines, and they were also U-boats, and there's, there's all sorts of things going around. But basically, e-boat, as Calvin Gasman points out, stands for e enemy boats. Rapid race back. Were e-boats used for command insertion? Not really. Technically, Germac. You've read, S-boat is a derivative of German name. British had basket name for all German small ships. The boats. Technically, yes, it does start out like that, but as a rule, e boat tends to be when British are referring to it, referring to the Chanel boats, who were the big ones, as far as they're concerned. That's called D Day training. Was Louis Mountbatten in charge by any chance? He's usually around during a, a fluster clock. Good writing. Uh, not on that one, as far as I know. Were there any motor torpedo boats in the Irish Sea, e.g. E Pembrokeshire Act, or were e-boats not a threat? Uh, not really there. They didn't really get to there. The e-boats don't really have that range. And there's all sorts of disputes over how long their range is, but the Irish Sea is a little bit too far from them. Very much so. Were there any uh, rapid raise back? Have leave my band alone. There are so many other commanders to pick on. Yeah, yeah. Got on. Was there anything Louis Mountbatten is actually good at? I'm not sure. Some form of form of politics. Five summer, rapid race. After the war, S boat was used for intelligence in the Baltics. German crew, British, and overall command. Oh, yes, they did like to do that. So they were actually quite good for that. And as you can see, they're quite well armed, but they do displace 100 tons. They do have a lovely top speed, but how often do they manage to get to use the top speed? That's the thing. And the British do realize they have this top speed because they watch them occasionally. But they don't have that many in much in terms of guns. Three 20mm cannon, uh, one single, one twin mount and a single 37mm flat cannon. It's not really a lot of firepower in terms of the British, and compared to what the British are putting up there. They also have a range, roughly, of 800 nautical miles at 30 knots. This goes down a lot when you're trying... Uh, let's put it this way. It can go up, it can go down, but it does go down with the sea states and the differing of those things. 
Broadly speaking, though, they complete about... Mm, I think it's roughly 200 units. But there is some dis debate. We know they cancelled nearly to over 200. Well over 200. But the thing is, the British were very ca were fairly capable at um, dealing with those when they came out. Carl Harman, okay, was wondering if the MTB's British ones, that is, were deployed there to help with Escort Tech to allow larger ones to be further out as Irish Sea relatively small again. I think there were a few, but I don't think they were... Again, the escorts you need in the Irish Sea are usually of the anti-submarine warfare variety or and the anti-air variety, because that's your major threat. So they need to be able to deal with air and submarine threats. So usually trawlers are fine for doing those ones. Rapid Razor, what kind of range did they have? Would they have been more effective against tribals? Uh, no, and they were really not that effective against tribals as the various battles like... Let, let's put it this way. Um, this book has some very interesting descriptions of what happens to e-boats and R-boats and various other vessels when they get caught by tribals. Tent Flotilla likes them. Strub, what do they fear most? Uh, aircraft, MTBs, DD sloops? Probably MT MGBs. Uh, if you are a Schnell boot and you are an e boat and you get caught by Royal Navy's dog boats, you haven't got much of a chance. Uh, the dog boat is armed with a lot of heavy, a lot of for its size, relatively heavy firepower and very fast, very accurate shooting is usually the normal way of them. And they tend to get very close. And as I was explaining in one of them as examples, well, uh, there was the... And with the same preface as I put in in the introduction video, that this is a story which I was told in Cambridge when I was visiting Churchill College, and I haven't really done much research into it. Uh, but the story was there was a RNVR officer who was either a PhD student or a lecturer at Cambridge in classics, ancient Greece. And basically, he armed his dog boat with a ram. They were already fairly strong and would often were used to, often did manage to cut e boats in half. But they would often sustain damage themselves. Classic example again was the what I one of the, uh, the stories I read out. But in this, he actually reinforced it so they wouldn't get damaged, and waited inside a convoy. And when some e-boats came inside the convoy, blasted one to smithereens with his guns and rammed the other one in half, as you do. Never cross academics who have spent far too much of their time studying ancient warfare. They will bring it back on to you. <sighs> Jeff Vila, did e-boats always carry four torpedoes? Yes, they always did carry their reloads. Unless, it, well, it's mission dependent, of course. If they're doing a special mission that requires them to be lighter, then they wouldn't be. But otherwise, they normally were. Speaking of sea states, I would not want to take one to the North Sea or the Channel. No, the Channel was slightly better than the North Sea, but it really wasn't that great. Sometimes, Dr. Uh, ratio of steel to wood. How much more did the Yanks like to play lumberjack than the Brits for the small boats? I thought the Brits preferred steel. Uh, most of the boats we're going to be talking about are made of planed wood. Very, very plain wood. Vice Admiral Nelson. So, hello, Sean Brennan. Vice Admiral Nelson. Uh, Jeff Miller. Later ones sometimes carried mines instead of spare torpedoes. They could always be carry um, a couple of mines on each side instead of the torpedoes. That was always part of the fittings. But again, it's mission specific. Come, what would you say would be the modern day equivalent of an e boat? Mm. 
Well, the Germans would probably claim uh, the Germans would probably cl claim it's. Um, Oh, let me just remind myself. The Brunswick class. Um, but honestly, that thing weighs in at 1,840 tons. So I'm not so sure about that. I would say some of the... Iranian boat fast attack boats which they're trying to sort of deploy and use are probably edging towards it but they're not really getting there <laughs> Dirt squad I'd imagine the e-boats in the uh, e-boats in our would be the lack of air cover the RF would make a mess of them in the channel they could at least get some of the cover they were mostly would do night operations anyway this was for most of the small boats doesn't matter which side you're on. And as we know from experience with the Channel Dash, the RAF were not always... They did get very better at it, but uh, they got better at it, but they weren't always the best in terms of coordinating with the Navy and everyone else on anti-ship strikes. And Jeff Beale, Israeli SAR class missile boats. I suppose they could be the equivalent of them. But again, they're a bit big. Sean Brennan, 200 units. So 25% of that took part in one action. That is one historical account, yes. Um, this is why... Uh, it's gonna, As I said, there was an action which I talked about earlier uh, where there were 50 vessels involved in one action, apparently. And... When you're talking about that as a sheer number, that's pretty much most of the deployable force, if not all the deployable force for that evening. I can understand that for a major operation, them doing this and seeing if it work, I don't imagine it was a constant, and it doesn't seem to be a constant, but then you get some historians, and I was reading one book, and they were going, it was regularly 50, 60 vessels were deployed on a single operation. I was going, no, no. Maybe if you're talking about a very broad operation where there's lots of different movements going on, but one operation, one attack, no. And even in that attack, what seems to be, get involved really is about mm, 18 to 24 out of the 30 to actually get through to the target and actually end up getting engaged. Last time, Jeppa class phased out a decade ago. Last part of the German Schnellboot flotilla. Hmm. Scott, I was thinking more about coastal command patrols. Again, they they try their best, but you have to remember coastal command. Again, are the Cinderella service in the RAF, like the Coast Guard are in the US. The, the coastal command are the Cinderella service in the uh, in the Royal Air Force. Scold, scold, scold from Calvin. Yeah, that could have. Soviet Ossa and Corona class Mr. Boats. Hmm. Anyway, so here's the thing. When we start talking, uh, one of the things that often uh, I found in some books they were writing was that the Royal Navy was completely unprepared for the e boat war. No, it wasn't. It knew exactly what it was going to have to fight. It was preparing plans, it had them in construction, that's why they came available when they did. It had been working on them pretty much, uh, fairly solidly since about 19... Uh, the early 1930s, they definitely started to have a major force a start, uh, idea coming back in for motor torpedo boats. They'd grown them hugely in World War One, then cut them down because you don't really need them in peacetime, and then they were growing them again in... Well, with the run up to World War Two, 
what they weren't prepared for, as we've discovered when we discussed when we were talking about the convoy war and all these things, it was the fall of France and the fall of Norway. That was not on the British radar. Norway was supposed to be able to defend itself because it's freaking difficult to get to. Uh, and honestly, Norway could have defended itself. It was because certain elements in the cabinet managed to divert so much to stop a because they didn't want to upset Germany, so they were sending out the alert. Instead of making the alert going out via radio out to their people, they sent the alert out via the post. If they sent it out by radio, all the ships, all the forts would be manned, armed, all the troops, mobilized, all the militias and the soldiers mobilized. I think, honestly, the German invasion would have been eaten up by Norwegian troops. I think the Norwegian people would have annihilated it. Because the German invasion was really not that strong. It was entirely predicated on surprise. I.e. Blitzkrieg. Surprise. We're here. You didn't expect us. With France. Well, again. It's not the French army which are so much defeated. They're still fighting. It's more the French army leadership are completely outfoxed. And they're outfoxed by the fact the Germans go through a forest. I'm sorry, but no. So this is the changes, the scenario. It also changes the numbers you need. It massively, mahusively increases the numbers of torpedo boats and motor gun boats you need. It massively increases the operational scope of them. It massively increases your other requirements because there are other ships going to be needed to fill in other roles elsewhere, which means... You need to have more of these small vessels to fill in those gaps. It just... Mm. Sal Thompson, Doug Clark, how would these stack up against the new patrol boats that are being deployed to the rock on the south of Spain? <laughs> okay, so, tech-wise, sensor-wise, the new patrol boats are probably better by a country mile. But I wouldn't like to be in a fighting one versus a D-boat. The thing is, though, the mission's different. It's about presence. It's about policing and maritime security, not war fighting. Uh, I would love to have a modern D, a D variation of the D-boat in the Royal Navy. I would love to have a few of them in places like Gibraltar. And probably have them, you know, to cover places like the the channel and the entrance to the channel and the Scottish Highlands and Islands and those sort of areas. And as something we could deploy to support a forward deploy to support allies in places like the Straits of Hormuz. But we're not gonna get them. Because the moment you start buying those small ships. Someone's going to go, oh, well, you then don't need <coughs> this. And you do actually need it. The thing is, these small vessels are adjuncts to. They're not replacements for the bigger ships. There we go. We've got the Type A, the Fair Mild Type A. Good looking ships. And the Vosper 73. Now, please note, you can always tell the original Vospers versus the older Vo uh, versus the Vospers, which get built in World War II. Something ha and the, the torpedo launchers get sort of the bow gets raised up, and the torpedo launchers, in comparison, seem to drop down. Uh, mainly, that's to improve sea keeping, and actually gives them a slightly far higher speed as well. Hello, Roland Cash. Don't worry about being late. Felix Lee, what's the Mamacom Campbell MB world first record world record speed uh, speed ninety thirty eight Blue Bergu involved in designing the boats? Um. I think he did work with one or two companies, but I don't think he did too much on that one. I think he was more involved in other areas of design going on. Death Squad, uh, the French also had a pathological allergy to using radio to distribute orders. So instead of taking three hours to organize a counterattack, it took 30. The joys of dispatch riders. Oh. 
Good lord. Stonsidanus, saying adjunct makes me triggered a little. Hmm. Not sure why adjunct makes you triggered. Unless you've got an adjunct professorship. <laughs> mm, let's turn that out a bit. It started off nice and light, and then <laughs> it got dark. Just need to move this. Right. <sighs> mm. Danke, uh, Dunrick Ironhammer. There was also a problem with some Norwegian officers being Nazi sympathizers. Yes, but their NCOs were good enough that, frankly, I don't think the officers would have had much of a chance. Hal Kangangam. Nuance triggers me. Well, this is going to be nuance because the Fairmile A's and the Vosper 73s are Genesis in so, so many ways. But honestly, the Vosper 73s are ordered based off what we'll be looking at next. But because she has such a starring role in Dunkirk, I'll leave her for until Dunkirk. Where basically she gets nicked by Admiral Ramsey, who after that point becomes the one man a shouting platform for the small boat war. And basically will have an argument with anyone at any time if they try and say that motor torpedo boats, etc. aren't worth it. Hello, Blue Shirt Buddha. Don't worry about being late. Third Squad, the French didn't like radio because they partially broke Enigma, and I think paranoid the Germans could do the same. Therefore, they relied on physical notes and telephone. I'm sorry, I, I yeah, I, I do understand that, but I'd have just changed my codes the moment war began. I'd have had a code a set of codes I was using in peacetime, and I'd have just gone right now. When a war begins, you open this sealed book, a sealed folder. That's your new code. Mm hmm. Now. For these bo boats, and these vessels, I have to say, you really can't beat these books. Because that's Fairmile and Vosper covered. Now, I am also, like someone else who commented earlier, hoping soon to get part three, volume three and volume four, and probably a couple others about, but, you know, we'll see when they come. All the Fairmile designs, from the A type through the B, C, D, and to the uh, D, C, and D to the H and the one-off F type, were laid off in the Lockhart lofts, and the templates repaired there, including those required for the armor plating when fitted. The templates were periodically, che uh, periodically checked for close accuracy. For each new design, mock-ups were made at the Lockhart works of Deckhausen and Bridges for approval by the service departments concerned. Each new development and request was fed into the production lines of a minute with minimum fuss. The average monthly consumption of timber was as follows. Mahogany, 50,000 cubic feet. Pitch pine and, B and British Columbia pine, 30,000 cubic feet. English oak, 5,000 cubic feet. Teak and Erico, 8,000 cubic feet. English elm, 2,000 cubic feet. Canadian rock elm, 1,000 cubic feet. Silver spruce. 4,000 cubic feet. Effective cooperation was received uh, from the members of the Timber Control Office, still handling supplies. The acquisition of logs suitable for keel sections were always difficult due to the required size. On occasion, when they were received from locations which had suffered bombing raids, pieces of metal were embedded in them. An annoying state of affairs at the time when the supply of broad um, brand saws was particularly difficult. 
Yeah. You receive trees from where they've had bombing. They've got pieces of metal in, which makes them bad for building ships out of. And they are very much wooden. Uh. The Fairmile Type A motor launch was designed before the war was cleared by Norman Hart on the instructions of Noel Merklin. The hull form was based on the fishery, on that of the fishing protection boat Viola, but no arm was indicated in the original proposal. When the Admiralty declined to place an order, Macklin, convinced that his ideas for mass production were sound and that wooden motor launches would indeed be required in some numbers, undertook to have her built himself. She was ordered on 27th July 1939 from Woodnut's Boatyard on St. Helens, across from Bembridge on the Isle of Wight. Her keel was laid on 29th of October, while the prototype was still incomplete, and thus before sea trials began, the Admiralty had a change of heart. A severe shortage of anti-submarine motor launches was acknowledged. The Admiralty ordered 24 type A-type motor launches on the 22nd of September 1959, soon after war was declared. Only after the trials of the B had proven it to be far superior was the order for the A-type reduced to 12 units. So, A-type was beaten on the stands by the B-type. Mm -hmm. Right, Dunkirk. Now, Dunkirk has 102 in it, and 102 is a pretty cool little vessel. But let's just answer some questions first. Jerrison tells all soldiers not to open book and wall until war begins. Soldier immediately opens it. Okay, maybe you'd have to have it locked. The colonels will probably still open it, but let's be honest. Hmm. Sav Thompson, uh, thank you. That's right. Thank you. I'm tinkering with a ha Habardian class that could be direct to a cruiser. Ooh, fun times. Danny Freeman, there are speed there are times when speed is worth compromising security of communication. Yep. Ron Cash, the allies of the French had enough trouble trying to decipher the meaning of their uncoded messages. Uh, yeah. That's why inside the package you have a second ceiling saying, no, I really mean it, but there's something shiny here, but here's something shiny to distract you. <laughs> Good work. Uh, Jerison, Teak and Erika are lovely bits of timber to work with. They are. I scan, I scan the therapy. Vospa MTBs and American Petite Boats are surprisingly bulbous in plain and plan view. They look so sleek from the side. Mm, true. Derp Squad, there are a lot of things that the French should have done. Politics got in the way as usual. Every French government was paranoid about a coup d'etat, so preferred to spend on forts over hardware. Mm, yeah, well, that keeps everything in a nice place. My next ray. Late to the stream. Have I? Want to know? The advantage is advantage compared to US PT boats, since they operate on such different theatres. Pretty much that. One's adapted for one theatre, one's adapted for the other. We have covered this when I did the not big ships one. And the whole difference between the two was basically one was made for a war in a very rough sea, close quarters fighting in sort of these sort of operations and that you <laughs> the operations you find in the Channel and North Sea. One of the others are largely made for the Pacific. What's interesting is when you have the two operating side by side in the Mediterranean, and neither's really a perfect fit for it, but both do quite well. Right, so the thing I like about these books. is they have chapters about certain specialist individuals as well. And this is 102, which, as I've said, takes part in Dunkirk, but I'm more interested in it as a vessel. So, 
The 1935-36 to 36 naval estimates were presented to Parliament on the 1st of March 1935. There's a supplementary estimate in December to cover seven destroyers of new type, and the large tribal class. This represented the first stage in covering the naval deficiencies as reported by the Defence Requirements Committee. The estimates being 60 million, including supplementary, whilst the actual cost was 64 million, and well, nearly 65 million. Six motor torpedo boats were ordered to a new design by a British powerboat company, MTBs 1 to 6, the first since the end of the Great War. But there was no Admiralty order for Vosper. The 1936 to 37 estimates were presented on the 6th of March 1936. With the acceleration of shipbuilding abroad and the imminent end of treaty restrictions, it's recognised that British shipbuilding could have to be it would have to be stepped up and shipyards modernised. Consequently, three supplementary estimates were presented and approved during the, the year. One on the 28th of April for 10.3 million, one on the 7th of July for 1.1 million, and one in autumn for a small sum to start a cruiser and a flotilla of destroyers. Four additional MTBs were ordered. Three from the British Powerboat Company, MTB 789, and an experimental steel hydrofold design from White at Cows, MTB 101. But there was still no Aberty order for Vosper. The company had not been idle, however. From 1931, Vosper had been developing a new a range of standard basic designs, beginning with jolly boats. They were small, hard shine, fast, semi planing boats. The 16 foot prototype and later other production ver versions of 13 foot, 15 foot, and 18 foot. In 1934, Peter Duquesne came, took over the responsibility of the design for the company with an increasing design staff. In 1935, a 25 foot motorboat was placed on production, being used by the Royal Navy as a captain's boat for general duties. This was followed by a larger 35-foot version to be employed as a picket boat or on board or aboard capital ships. At the same time, Vosper working uh, workforce gained experience in standardization, improving their uh, craft. With orders for the Admiralty's new motor torpedo boats going to their rivals, Vosper considered the possibility of developing a larger, faster, more powerful vessel, which would be more seaworthy and faster than those of their competitors. The company approached the Admiralty on a number of occasions with a request to design and construct such a prototype, without success. A few were impressed with the idea, however, and it was indicated that if a contract was placed, it would be for a boat with a speed in excess of 40 knots and capable of carrying two 21-inch torpedoes, as well as being armed with a small caliber anti-aircraft gun in a revolving turret. Not too dissimilar to the Chanel boat, or any boat, is it? In addition, the 1936 Ghost specification included the ability to operate in the open sea, for example, in the Channel North Sea in moderate sea conditions, both at scale 5, Additionally, the approach cruising speed and range should be such that a crossing should be, could be made during the hours of darkness, from example, from, for example, Dover to the French coast or Felixstowe to Hooks of Holland, allowing for an engagement with an opposing force during the night before returning to base. After a great deal of consideration, the directors decided to design and build at the company's expense a private venture boat, which provided, uh, provi which provided she met the design and suggested performance in envelope in all respects, be submitted for Admiralty official trials in the hope that this would be result in her eventual purchase for the Royal Navy and pave the way for more orders. Starting with no preconceived ideas and a blank sheet of paper, the designer soon realised that the vessel would have to be a complete rethink and larger than the 60-foot British motor power motorboat MTBs then under construction. For the required performance, it was necessary to select suitable engines. And here's where it goes interesting. They start off by selecting Italian engines. And those Italian engines had originally been developed for Russian motor torpedo boats because the Russians needed to upgrade their PTD boats. So, you know, you have all sorts of fun going. And this is a really cool little vessel. I have to say the fact that it then get, they get turned into a 73 foot and that becomes the standard. But what you've noticed is that probably is that both Fairmile and Vosper are actually starting out producing these themselves without any government input or rather minimal government input. And there is a reason for this, and it's Henderson's sort of dark arts going on here, and it's the style of sea control, uh, um, third sea lord sort of naval constructors, the uh, naval construction office that he runs, controls office, is that Bryn has a large competitive shipbuilding industry, a large at all levels at this time, and they're taking advantage of it. They're actually getting shipyards to build ships, which they're not even paying for as private ventures that they may take up. So think about that. The two most common designs, as most especially that one, but also that one, 
are completely hands off constructed. Right. This one, thank you very much. This was from a div division command post to the units in the front. It was a comedy of errors, with the major getting in his car and searching for the colonel to get the clear orders. That wouldn't surprise me again with the French. That's good. A 10% over on by government standards is pretty much on budget. Hmm. Freeman. Oh, so many problems with the French command and control. To be fair, I think part of the problem was that the Germans knew exactly what we missed to, to target this point. Yeah. So, Thompson, Dr. Clark, in your best 40s radio voice, Canada, your premier supplier for your shrapnel free pine and oak. Weekly shipments with daily orders taken. <laughs> Derp Scott. Dan Freeman, the Germans were as shocked as everyone else that the Ardennes attack worked as well as it did. They thought it would disrupt the defence, not effectively bypass it. Yeah, they weren't expecting them to leave a forest completely. Who does that? The French have fought the English in goodness knows how many wars. The British have a habit of going through forests. You'd have thought by the time it got to World War II, the French would have gone, forest, can't I need to secure that. Put an infantry division. A couple of infantry divisions dug in in it. Sure, Matt. Take a drink. Junk. Naval history. Live bingo. Lionheart X-ray. The 102 boat looks like it would be a great pleasure boat if you stripped the weapons off. Did they happen to sell these boats both for civilians? Yes. Quite a lot of them got sold to civilians for various things, including a couple got made into ferries. Um, many got turned into pleasure craft. Lots become houseboats. As I said, the only surviving steam gunboat is currently a houseboat. <sighs> they ran into some resilience whose commanders ran from five miles behind lines before the men on the front were forced to retreat. Wasn't that the? Wasn't the, the, the forum was unguarded? No, it wasn't unguarded. It was just not guarded enough. Strap doctor, do you feel the consolidation of yards has led to fewer options and lack of creativity? It certainly left to a lot. Led, led to a lot more groupthink. Um, Dunrick Ironham, yes, they were, were Germans, not English. They surely wouldn't take a note of the English playbook. Uh, sure, Mike. I mean, if you're going to do the Breda variant, tell them. That I'm just, and they, yeah. Sometimes, just like a few lumber jer uh, jerks would do good in France, then farm around with hoes and cat. Mm. Uh, the French war gained it, but they chose to ignore the result. Yes. Ron Cash, guarded with reserves with no AA guns, mon Dieu, and no anti-tank weapons as well, if I remember. Or much in the way of artillery support. All things which are kind of useful. Now I'm going the wrong way. So, after Dunkirk. And I'm going to be back in a second. Just quickly pop up and answer a question.
All right. So, Dan Freeman, I once went through the fall of France trying to work out where to make a what if, but gave up when I realized how fundamental the C2 problems were. The what if I would have is what if the French army was entirely taken over by the British army with their radio units, uh, having spare radio units, taking over the communications, command and control at all levels. Um, that's about the only option you have for trying to fix that C2 issue. Take care, Sean Mac. See you in 50 minutes. <laughs> oh. Right. So, let's consider this here. Convoys and confusion. So, 19, basically, 1940 onwards. After the fall of France, after Dunkirk, what do you have these boats getting involved in? Well, you have a lot of convoys and a lot of issues coming up. The coastal convoys are a major part of the British infrastructure network, especially as it readied itself for fear of invasion for the Battle of Britain. For all these realities, as it built the boats and got that wood around the country, you know, um, it's one thing to say, oh, we're going to deliver it to Liverpool in 1944 and distribute it from there around the country. You can do that in 1944. To an extent. In 1940, in 1941, well, there is a reason you have all those ports around the UK. There is a reason you have all those spaces, because A, you need to unload a lot of ships to get the equipment, uh, to get all the stuff ashore. So you need a lot of port space. And B, you are moving around quantities which... It'll be quite difficult to move around by rail or by road. There isn't enough of that transport going around. Britain does have more. It has a lot more than some other nations do at this point, And is a lot better connected than some other nations are at this point. But it still needs the Navy, the Merchant Marine, to move the stuff around. Oh, and while I remember, because I get told off occasionally for getting this, there is a subscribe button down there if you want to be updated. Okay, well, no, when I've put out videos, and there is a little bell which will update you, tell you exactly when I put up uh, videos. You can you can change the notifications to tell when the videos are relevant to your interests, or you just always get them. And thank you to everyone who is a member of Patreon. Thank you to everyone who's a Discord member. Thank you to everyone who does Super Chats. Thank you all those people, because you keep me in books at the moment. Oh, well. Normally, I should say you keep me in books. At the moment, you're also helping me put money towards building my new bookcase when I eventually get my office in the garden, which hopefully shall be built at some point uh, not too long away. Um, in which case, I'm going to be buying a lot of marine ply, um, about 18 mil thick, I think is probably strong enough, and building some rather lovely bookshelves, which will go roughly 2.7 meters by about 50 centimeters thick. So width of about 50 centimeters, all there, nicely stacked up. It's roughly two, uh, the, the office is going to be two and a half by 2.7 meters wide. So I'm working out plenty of book space for that. But that's where all the money is going on now, on marine ply. Because it's not cheap, but it's good. And it's what I'm used to working with, thanks to my dad. Hmm.
Hi, Greg Stasinski. Cat needed the vet. I hope the cat is okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Thanks. He's sneezing and got a runny nose, bit poorly, but got antibiotics and decongestant. Should get better. I'll cross fingers for you. In fact, I think I'm sure, fairly sure we're all crossing fingers for you. Apart from possibly the fluffy research assistant, but he's probably crossing fingers for you. Maybe not the cat. He's quite nice to cats, but not he, he, he's not universally dead, you know, loved by them all. <sighs> Abazowski, there is no subscribe even more button. Uh, I think that's what we call Discord for. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I'm going to go live. I can't. No, but I have been told off for just doing that at the end. Someone has uh, someone has been doing their research and looking into these things and has been trying to get me to be slightly better at it. Very nicely. Felix, British freight trains had no automatic brakes, therefore they ran very, I mean, very slowly. Um, they did have braking systems, and they didn't run as slowly as all that. Um, there is a, again, there is a preconception in some books that you have to be using one sort of system to make it, to be able to run fast, and the British use a sort of different system, and it works quite well for the British. It's not a system I would recommend for anyone else, but it works well in the British, uh, the British lines and the British systems. But you know, so they are moving the stuff around quite quickly. Hmm. Gahman, also, doctor. Sorry, I haven't become a patron yet. I had to pay for recovery for a van for my father, and not not got the money tonight. Wait, don't worry. <laughs> I'm never going to be one of those people who's going to keep pressuring people. Got to become a patron. Got to become. I, I'm telling people because, as I've said before, it's my book money, but and my money for bookshelves. And as I've also admitted at the moment, technically, although there are all sorts of weird things going on, contract, technically, as none of my teaching contracts are active, technically, yeah, technically at the moment. Uh, my so is my current source of income, so I'm supposed to be slightly more professional with it. Makes Nat West happier about me living off a credit card. Run cash. Surprisingly, this channel should be like donor cars, an opt-out situation. I would never be so cruel. Jerison, please don't use Marine Ply. I'm. I, there's a reason I'm working with Marine Ply. Uh, my granddad and my father both built Marine Ply bookshelves. So it's kind of continuing the family tradition. Yes, it's expensive. I do know that. But it's the family tradition, and they do. It does produce very, very nice, very, very strong bookshelves. That can also take model railways. Not that that's part of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Great, Fluffy, fluffy, fluffy research assistant would like the cat. He's very friendly. I'm glad. Then he would like them. Concentrate. No, those credit card interest rates don't remind me. Uh, Carmen, what was your opinion on the rumor of the army losing its tanks? I was <laughs> too young to know, but it was similar to uh, with our old aircraft carrier. Don't get involved. These things. They always these rumors always come up, and in the nicest way, I sit there and I'm looking at going. But you say you're saying it's great because we saved 56 main battle tanks. How useful are 56 main battle tanks? <laughs> uh, 
But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Jarrison, Ply has a shorter life than MDF. Ply will warp, even Marine, long before MDF. MDF is also better for the environment. Mm. Well, my grandfathers are still going after about 40 years, so I'd say that's probably good enough. And considering I'm building it in a shed in the, gar uh, in, in the garden when it comes in. Karma. Also, I do love Bill Trumps and always love listening to them. They always go, uh, do good sound. Very funny. Great for long journeys. Uh, plus, more, please, more special guests. There are some more. There are two more already loaded up next week and the week after. Anyway, right. We're on Fair Mile D motor gunboats. The dog boats. And there is a reason I haven't done capital M or capital B for this, because they really are gunboats. Uh, I have so far read off two armaments descriptions. I have another one in here of the D-Class. And weapons fit, they could be fitted with. And it's just, you know... Let's see, can we get... It says, element list C drawings. Right then, I'm seeing drawings. Oh, yeah. So. They could be armed with a two-pounder Mark 15 gun, two twin five-inch machine guns, in Mark V power mountings, two twin 303 Vickers machine guns, one twin Oracle on Mark V, a Holman projector, and two depth charges. Um... That was on the Eastern Mediterranean run. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they could also be armed with two six-pounders in Mark Seven mountings, two twin point five machine guns on Mark Five power mountings, two twin zero three or three uh, Vickers machine guns, two one twin or twenty millimeter Oricon on a Mark Nine manual mounting, four eighteen-inch torpedoes, two depth charges, and provisions for mines. Oh, Yelza. Or two six pounder guns on Mark 7 mountings, two single 20 mm Dorkins, or on Mark 2A mountings, two twin 303 Vickers machine guns, one twin 20 mm Dorkin, Arlecon mounting, and two depth charges. Oh, this is fun. One six pounder. Two twin 0.5 inch machine guns on Mark V power mountings. Two twin 303 Vickers machine guns, not shown. Two twin Oroclons on Mark IX mountings. Two 21 inch torpedo tubes. One twin 40 millimeter. Two depth charges. A single two inch rocket flare launcher and provision for mines. Remind me to never get in an argument with MTB 5003. Um, I, I, I don't think I'll be surviving that one. Ah, yes. Uh, and MTB758, uh, armed with two single 40mm Bofors guns on Mark 12 mountings, one twin 20mm Oracle on a Mark 9 mounting, one two-inch rocket flare launcher on the 40mm mounting, and provision for mines and depth charges, and that was in 1953. Um, Oh my lord, Lubber Duck. How'd that thing stay afloat? Two single six pounders, one double 40 millimeter, two double 20 millimeters, and two twin Vickers machine guns. 
Oh, plus two 21 inch torpedoes. Um, yeah. Right. So, these things were armed. Let's just leave it at that. They were armed. They were the. We're turning up to the party. We're saying hello. Hello. Goodbye. We bring our own fireworks. That is what the D boats were for. And honestly, I have run out of iron brew to think about uh, to commiserate for the poor Kriegsmarine. Hmm. Ah, uh, okay. Daniel Hoon, female dog motor gunboats. Uh, so many guns, it makes them an American happy. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> uh, run cash. Okay, we mentioned Bill Trump and got away with it. Just no one mentioned. <laughs> no. All right. Martin Knock, female Ds are just awesome boats. They just scream, come and have a go if you think you're hard up. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That was their entire bollock. <laughs> These things, they ambush e boats. On a regular basis, the Germans are sort of going, We came here the hunter. We are now the hunted. <laughs> oh. We would go back to the D boats for a bit before we get to the channel dash. Um. <laughs> Come on, guys, don't forget. How many guns, like, how many push ups do you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Right so, and then you seem to trouble to translate it. Never managed to get the one I like. Mm, that's okay. It's Sam Thompson. Dr. Lark, you forgot the partridge in the pear tree. Probably. Uh, uh, I was asking, this sounds like, sir, how many guns do you want to ship? <laughs> yes. <laughs> let, let, we're not even getting into the engines on these things. Um, Okay, so I will lead, read out the engine. So technically, the Fairmile D starts out with. Technically, their machinery is four Packard 12 cylinder, 1250 brake horsepower, supercharged 4M 2500 petrol engines with a dumb flow exhaust, uh, capable of 12 knots at 1000 RPM, 15, uh, 17 knots at 1500 RPM, 21 knots at 1800 RPM, two, 25 knots at 2000 RPM, and 24, uh, 30 knots at 2400 uh, RPM. Speed, 34.5 knots designed maximum at 85 tons, 29.5 knots designed for continuous speed, and 32 knots actual maximum at 105 tons with reduction gear um, fitted. The reality was, <coughs> those engines were modified and played with. And modified and played with, and modified and played with, and by world at the end of World War Two, the raw, there is an interesting line I found in an archive document once where a constructor has literally written the standard the idea of a standardized dog boat. Well, Fair mile D was his actual phrase. Dog boat was then in, it was in. Um, speech mark, quote marks, is a myth after the craft reaches 90 days of service. Within 90 days, they will no longer be a standardized vessel, and they will pick up weapons wherever. <laughs> 
Jarek, and that friendly menu let me thinking, did they experiment with rockets like some Cromwell riding tankers and PT boats? Yeah, they experimented with lots of things. When you're 20, 21 and are an afterthought, you know someone might be having a bad day. You know, they're just extra. Uh, once going to spend some time with some Gurkhas, food was incredible. Mm, it is good. Uh, Carmen Carlson, could the dog boats compensating for lack of Second Amendment to Magna Carta? <laughs> I realized no one had mentioned the Blackbird Blackburn in the first hour. I had to correct the situation. Why? Um, Dan Freeman, the Magna Carta was for the benefit of people who commanded armies. <laughs> the right to bear arms was in the British Constitution from the 17th century, but limited to Protestants. Hmm. Uh, okay. Dan Freeman, just to point out, the six pounders on the dog boats were 57mm, like the Type 31s. Yep. That's interesting. They actually varied the RPM to vary the speed. Very different from aircraft usage, where they use constant speed props and constant RPM. Yeah. Um, they also do all sorts of things to add this. But it, uh, there is the... Oh, what was it? Yeah, uh, there was one which ended up with, I think it was Griffin Mark Sixes in. At least, well, we know at least one ended up with Griffin Mark Sixes in, which technically bring it, uh, increased its its horsepower by an extra two thousand four hundred horsepower because it had four of them instead of four Packards. They were the navy didn't know where the griffins came from. Okay, they weren't sure. They got them supplies though, but they they didn't know where they came from. And well, that was quite successful. That vessel, uh, if you can imagine what increasing your horsepower from a not disrespectful five thousand brake horsepower to seven thousand four hundred brake horsepower does for your um capabilities of speed. Still the same weight. Actually, I think the Griffins were slightly lighter. And they needed to protect them from the salt water, but they did that quite well. Um, yeah. I was asking, I just imagined if Polish Navy chases were of this type instead of lighter British powerboat type. Uh, I think they were the boats. Uh, Martin Dot all seas. Uh, Martin Locke, Fem LDs are the reason the UK doesn't have a Second Amendment. They took the right to bear on the bank. <laughs> yep. Uh, that was called The Magna Carta was a negotiation for the king to avoid either being deposed or leaning against the weak balcony railing. E yeah, that usually works. That Thompson, that's what it took 90 days for the dogs to find new boats. Surprised they waited that long. Or were the masters watching to close still? Uh, no, it just took 90 days for them to decide how they were going to customize it, I think. Or oh, within 90 days. And that was when they did their checks. So they did their checks every three months. So basically they're saying that by the time the first check happens, it's no longer a standby vessel. Come should the RN make a new version of the dog boat to protect British trade in Gulf? Seems cost effective and makes around your Navy go by mile. <laughs> well, you can keep this for short to It should be tempting. Hello, Night Heron Productions. Calm. Also, should the US get a version for the same reason? <laughs> eh. The trouble is, I don't think these days in peacetime they would get away with the modifications. Um, Sam Thompson, I think you'd have a lot of fun with uh, uh, fun on War Thunder with small boats. The Merlins in the D was a great setup in the game. Mm. And Calm. It's kind of, come to think of it, did they get the 130 and 150 octane fuel like the RAF was using in 1944-45? Yeah, they did. <laughs> oh, they had a lot of fun with those. No, seriously, the D-boats are just lovely. And then you've got the sensor suite, right? So, radars and electronics fitted. Type 286, which is the same as destroyers could carry. Type 242, IFF interrogator. 
Uh, type 253, IFF for a transponder. Type 291U from 1943. Type 241, IFF integrator. US Navy SO type from 1944. Type 286U from early 1945. Oh, and they also had a, a Type 715A hydrophone for anti-submarine warfare work. Deck planking, two thicknesses, uh, one and a half, 15, uh, 30, uh, 15, 32 or inch teak. King plank, three inch times one and a half inch teak. Spruce stringers, three inch times one and a three quarter inch. And by the way, if you ever want to build your own M60, um, a D class, you can build this one. It has all the stats for what you need to build it. Not sure if you can get the weapons, but you can build it. All right, so we're on to the channel dash, and really I should. Get on with the show, because we are onto the channel dash for a second time, so we'll do that, but I'll start it off properly. Seth uh, Thompson, high test fuel. Min uh, uh, medical laughing, sir. I owe you a brew, Doctor. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, Martin Nock, one flotilla of fair Maldi boats into the Gulf. Iran gives up naval operations. <laughs> Uh, you know, Scott, are the US uh, Vietnam era of patrol boats and later SWC uh, Swick boats a modern version of the motor gunboat? They're definitely trying to get there, but no, don't have the same fun. Kahaman, I'm sure the regional commander would turn a blind eye and have them all ready for next time. The Iranian Swing there, I'm big and on up. Uh, probably. Jerison, teak decks are pure gangster for a warship. That they are. Philip Sweet, maybe the Aztec operator was deaf after half an hour on the boat. Um, let's put it this way. I would not like to have tried to be using it while the boat was running at full speed. Uh, I really wouldn't have been, especially not all the Griffin. Or, seriously, the Griffin engine running at full speed. That would have been potent. But no, um, they had all sorts of modifications under them. Now, the Channel Dash of 1942 is a rather interesting scenario because it really is the first proper war work for the torpedo boats in terms of dealing with what a torpedo boat is traditionally to do. Because a torpedo boat, as it was originally developed, was this idea it was going to take out major enemy units. Well, usually for the Royal Navy, the major enemy units were miles away from where their torpedo boats were operating. And trust me, they came up with ideas for how to get closer. They were always trying to get closer to you. Always. Uh, but it was quite difficult for them to get that. So the Channel Dash happens. And we make a lot of discussions about the brave swordfish pilots, and frankly, they do an amazing job. But the fact is, the motor torpedo boats actually hit the, attack, uh, the dashing Germans first and report their positions. This is one of the things which actually helps the swordfish I think, get, uh, get in their attack. And the destroyers. The RAF main attacks don't happen till way after the destroyers. If you notice this, they happen really quite far up onto the, into the coast of Holland, almost past Belgium. But the fact is, it's one of those interesting scenarios, the Channel Dash. There is a certain British perspective which goes, yes, we'd like to sink these ships, but if we can't sink them, then parking themselves up in the North Sea and in Germany is actually far safer than them being down on the Atlantic coast. Because here's the question. Do you think the raid at St. Nazaire could have been carried out if there'd still been major ships sitting around there? Would they have been more alert? 
more expecting a raid than they already were. And it was bad enough. And they went. But, you know. Channel Dash is an interesting one. The torpedo boats as well, they're attacking in daylight, which is what they don't do. But they're doing it because these targets are high enough value enough that it's worthwhile the risk. And they do charge in, launching torpedoes like below. Uh, MTB219 is actually still around. That's an interesting thing as well. She's still around. Um, they're hoping to, from what I read, uh, they might have got further along than this in that, uh, now with all the COVID and everything else going on. Uh, they're hoping to restore her and get her back to so she looks like she's in her fighting trim. She does look fairly neat and tidy from the last pictures I've seen of her, but I, I think they're trying to do them even more. And it will be nice to have more of these boats around because they were a major part of the World War II war effort. And they do get kind of forgotten. Derp Squad. I've heard that units that do near Navy SEAL and search and destruction have great fun modifying their boats. How many miniguns can you attach? Can you fit two on that mount? Good job. Yeah. They're whom? Some of the Malta convoys tried towing motor launches to Malta. Uh, some for general purpose stuff and some for mine clearance work. They did and they got there. They were quite useful there. Plus, some of the bees which were towed there for one thing ended up doing all sorts of other things. So when you realize that a fair mile B can be adapted to pretty much anything within 48 hours, that's when you realize how ubiquitous and capable they were. That because they had steel um, holding systems put into their decks, they could literally be modified to almost any task within that you could think of a small boat could be used for within very little time, as long as you had access to a crane that could do the heavy lifting. And if you didn't have that crane, you could still do it by manpower. It would just take longer. Come on. Now, let's get built some. I think we could call the, uh, could sell them to, at least, uh, to allies too, as a complementary unit to the Type 26 and Type 31, as well as a general purpose military vessel. Hmm. Could be fun. Jack Hunter, I think Portsmouth has historic dugout as a fair mile B, MGB161, I think, moored up close near Atreus Warrior. Just from memory as well. <laughs> it would be interesting to see what a modern version of an MG of, of a fair mile D class would be. What's more interesting is when you consider Vosper and Fair Mile both started from blank slates. Both started looking at, right then, what do we need to be able to do and then work back from the requirements to design the vessel? Not design the vessel to fit and then uh, then work out the requirements to fit it. So they worked out what were the equivalent requirements at the time? What would they need to be able to do? Um, Dirt Squad, would the Germans possibly be expecting even raid even less if a capital ship was nearby? It's argued that the air raid worked as well as it did, because no one would try. Uh, yes and no. When you've got a major tactical asset like a capital ship sitting there, that's something which is going to attract a lot of attention. The enemy are going to try and take it out, especially if they're Britain. So that does mean they, the enemy do tend to start focusing on things and start defending them. When they're not there... They realise they're a critical asset, but they think they're less down. They think the uh, the focus will shift with the capital unit moving away. So it's actually made easier. So the Sintner's Air Raid is pretty much dependent on fair miles. You have a C motor gunboat, which are cute. I like the Cs. They're the, the, the sort of the precursor to the D. Uh, you have the Bs, which make up sixteen of the little vessels involved, and total vessels involved are 18 little vessels. So there's 18 small boats, torpedo boats, or motor boats, the, these sort of things. There are two escort destroyers, two hunt class, and there's an HMS Camelton. Uh, 
and it's quite a sing it, it's quite a capable little force. They are quite well armed. They are quite well prepared. And the thing is, they're going to do something which is considered almost suicidal. Okay, there was no scenario where this force was getting out intact. There is a huge number of defenders in Saint Nazaire. Uh, they would have probably had a lot easier time if the bombers hadn't been doing the bombing job. The whole point of the bombing was it was supposed to keep people's uh, people's dead uh, heads down. It was actually so ineffective it actually did the reverse. It made them more alert. Sometimes that's the problem you come up with when you're doing these operations. You come up with a nice idea on paper, and the reality is rather different. The reality was, on paper, it was a good idea to start a, to, a, to bomb. On paper, it would keep the enemy's heads down. The idea was they would be very selective in their targets, very careful, and they wouldn't hit civilians and all these things, and... Honestly, they'd have been better with launching some light raids, probably with mosquitoes or something like that, coming in at high speed, dropping a few bombs in the port area, set up some fires, smoke, distract everyone. The interesting one is, uh, this one though, is the Vosper 1940 Custom MTB-74. Which again, there is a special chapter of in this book. Memory, it's page 56. Ah, oh, what do you know? Was well, right. The boat was therefore introduced to the team of light forces for the raid on St. Nazaire in France, with the object of firing the torpedoes at the southern Cassian if the converted town class destroyer HMS Cameltown with her cargo of explosive charges failed to ram successfully. The plan had been devised earlier, and on the 26th of February 1942, Commander R.E.D. Ryder was summoned to a meeting in London, chaired by the new Director of Combined Operations, Lord Louis Mountbatten. He was informed that he would command the operation for naval forces and was introduced to his army opposite number, Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Newman. The Sintner's Air Raid during the night of the 27th 28th of March 1942 proved to be a masterpiece of combined operations planning. Its main purpose was to destroy the massive gates of the graving dock, which had been constructed in 1935 for the building of the French line in Normandy, and was now the only dock outside German ca uh, Germany capable of accommodating the modern German battle pocket battleship. I don't think Tirpitz is ever a pocket battleship. I do find this book interesting. It refers to Scharnhorst and Eisenhower as heavy cruisers, which I will call them light battleships. I'll call them second-class battleships. I won't call them battle cruisers, but I don't call them heavy cruisers by any stretch of the imagination. And Scharnhorst, uh, Tirpitz is definitely not a pocket battleship. Uh, the presence of such a warship this far south would have posed a grave threat to Atlantic convoys. The aim was to smash the lock gates by using, absolute, uh, the, using the obsolete destroyer as a ram, and destroy them by explosive charges loaded in the for in the forward part of the destroyer, in time to go off after the raiding party had departed. Sixteen Fairmile B boat launches, four of them with 21-inch torpedo tubes, led by the Fairmile C MGB-314, aided by the MTB-74, took part in Operation Chariot, which left Falmouth on 1400 on Thursday, uh, 26th of March, escorted by two MTB-class hunt destroyers which were towing the MGB and MTB owing to their restricted range. They carried upper-deck long-range fuel tanks. Towards midnight, the convoy was, in the reach, was on the reaches of the Loire estuary, and uh, the drone of the uh, divisionary RF bomber raid could be heard. At 0122, Chariot's luck started to run out. Two searchlights settled on the Campbelltown, which had been converted to resemble a German destroyer. Signals were exchanged, but even eventually the defending forces, unable to identify the ships in mid-river, opened fire. 
The German naval ensign was struck and the white ensign ran up in its place. Steaming at eight knots, the force fought its way on. At 0134, Kamdahan smashed into the Cassian, tearing down back 40 feet off her bows. There was a tremendous firefight. Some of the commandos were landed, but others could not be, owing to the weight of the firepower. Within the, within the initial phase of the river battle, five Fairmile Bs had been destroyed or were sinking. Meanwhile, the MGB waited at the, the old entrance while Ryder went ashore to ascertain how effective camp plan had been placed. By the time he returned, he found that almost half the destroyers, old destroyer's crew had boarded the gun, uh, gunboat and MTB-74 was alongside. Satisfied with Campbelltown's position, Ryder ordered Wind to fire his delayed action torpedoes at the old entrance lock gates. As a, at a mere 20 yards range, this operation was not without considerable risk, and had the delayed action mechanisms failed, both the MTB and MGB would have been severely damaged. 74 is actually sunk on the way out trying to rescue other people. Okay. Then from friends don't let friends send flotillas of new dog boats into the Gulf alone. Mm. No, but it is so much more fun for the new dog boats if they are alone and it's just them. And their friend their lovely Iranians to make friends with. Okay. That's good. One major issue with the uh Sentinels Air Raid was bombers weren't given instructions on what to do if there was cloud. Who would imagine the possibility of clouds on the Atlantic coast? I know, it's terrible. Who would have thought weather on the Atlantic coast? Um, Dr. Clark, you're tasked with building a, uh, come on, Dr. Clark, you're tasked with building a modern dog boat. Can you use any Western weapon, i.e. NATO and allies or NATO? It must be easy adaptable to other roles. What do you arm it with and what would it look like? If I'm going to make it easy adaptable to any roles, I'd probably be looking at the Stanflex as a kind of sign system because I can take that off the shelf. I am probably looking at the region of 250 to 300 tons. And I'm probably going something fast and mean with lot with some 40, uh, with things on it like 40 millimeter. Well, uh, 57 millimeters could be quite nice on it. Uh, probably new strike uh, naval strike missile, the Norwegian one. I quite like that system. I prefer that over Exocet. And more than likely some form of surface to air missile if I can fit it in in the weight limit. But it, once you start looking at going, sort of, what am I building it for? I've got to, I want it to be able to do about 40 knots. And I want it to have a good range on that 40 knots. I want, the reason I'm going for the speed of 40 knots is I want to have the ability to get in and out of trouble quickly. When it wants to get into trouble, I want it to get into trouble. When it wants to get out of trouble, I want it to be able to get out of trouble. Probably stealth to an extent as well. Probably I end up looking something like the vessels that you're seeing still preparing in the Danish, Finnish, Swedish, and Norwegian navies. Mandok, that's like Iron is crying out for new Fairmile D boats as even the Type 45s need heroes. We all need heroes. And here we have is a command frigate, HMS Rubberhood. Now, I had done, a, of course, a two minute special on her, and I talked about her in the introduction. I like the idea of the command frigates. But there is a point at which they're being used because they're there, they're getting frigates assigned to them, and they want to do something with them that makes sense. And they're useful. The idea was very much to try and use them in blocking off a D-Day. To try and sort of move the command facilities you have ashore to the sea. But as I said, you do find, uh, you do start to find destroyers being used for it. And you also find them trying to use the cruisers to do that with destroyers, and the destroyers are going... 
why we have our own sensors. And the enemy are there. So why would I be checking with him whether he wants me to kill the enemy there? The enemy are there. I'm going after the enemy. They're there. They're there. And the cruiser commander is going, I want you to divide up and do this, this, this. Oh, just, oh, just go for it. Just do it. Fire star shell. Give them fire. Uh, give them the. Give them cover. Make it daylight. And it's to an extent the same with the coastal forces command frigates because, okay, with the fair mile bees when they're supporting them, they make sense. Whenever they try and attach them to dog boats, the dog boats are sort of going. I have my own radar. I know where the enemy is. Enemy there. Convoy there. I have to position myself here to keep in between the two. Why do you want me to go down there? What what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Why there? No, 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 no. I, I, I don't need to be there. I need to be... And it, 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 it just causes them fun. So basically, the whole idea a command for a vessel works when it brings something to the party which the ships it's commanding doesn't have. Right. Come on, let's just uh, just make sense. Let's replace your small motorboats guarding us with some uh, something with some bite. Then it needs to scale up bigger time. Mm. That's good. The bombers ended up just circling around in the cloud for a while because they weren't given instructions for what to do in case of clouds. I know. Then from recent uh, so now, uh, since there, a recent Zare raid, I would want to spend about a month developing a pattern of bombing prior to the raid, such as always sending a, ray, a raid around 11 p.m. and then nothing else. Then everything, everyone relaxes after. That's good. Oh, my battle was involved. Of course, he didn't think the possibility of clouds on the Atlantic coast. Don't get me started on that one here. Did the sound of bombers' engines help to cover the sound of approaching boats? Not enough, by any way, a stretch of the uh, imagination. Iskandata, problem with NGBs in the present day is the presence of guided missiles. Uh, a modern one could be so armed rather than with large guns and also have to contend with opposition similarly armed, including those on land. Yes, which is why you stealth it as much as you can, to an extent, but also uh, you have to consider that these things are pretty expendable. Uh, Daniel Freeman, uh, Carmen Gasman, you just described a scold again. Yes, I know, I did describe a scold, but the scold don't come with stand flex. Um, and to be honest, I prefer the Visby. Is it the Visby or the scold? It is, I think it's the Visby. Yeah, I prefer the Visbees. If I'm going to treat one like yeah, that, it's going to be the Visby. I do like that they do have their 57mm. Basically, the Visbees have uh, both holes 57mm, 8 RBS uh, 15 Mark II anti ship missiles, 4 torpedo launchers with various torpedoes. Um. And they were originally going to be fitted with uh, 12 Umkunkto uh, Sams. Mm, I, I, I liked that. Honestly, that would have made them very interesting. Very, very interesting. I like the Visby class. We've been over my um, love of these various vessels. I like the small navies. I think they have some very good uh, vessels in them. Dan Freeman, something like Hellfires and some Stingers? Uh, I would want something better than a Stinger. That's what I don't remember the name of the sailor, but he tried to fight off a destroyer with his 20 million cannon in the um, Sims Air Raid. Was killed as post. Was awarded the VC.
Hmm. In recognition, the German captain recognized him. Cool. Danny Freeman, could you get away with calling the new dog boats after travels? Probably not. Uh, so, Tom, Dr. Clark, my Howden class is a 80 to 90 foot times 20 foot times 18 cruise semi-planing hull with diesel electric drive and twin 40 millimeter up front. Am I close? Hey, get in there. Jemak, Danny Freeman, may, may I bring back HMS Picked that I posted a long time ago in Discord? Elongated Australian Cape class with VLS. Mm, interesting. Right. There, Scott. If dog boats were crewed by Polish, they'd say, no, understand, say again, repeatedly, while going and doing their own thing. <laughs> That's politer than what the Royal Navy wanted used to do. <laughs> Our radios are not working, but you are still talking to each other. They're not working. They're not working. <laughs> Thank you. I have visions of cruise commanders all having visions of being the next Nelson and trying to come with complex maneuvers. Who <laughs> destroys dog boats? All just all wanted to engage the enemy more closely. Mm, destroyers can count um, torpedo boats would count their own complex maneuvers quite happily. That was the problem. You see, if they have all the same information, in fact, probably better information than you have on your command ship because you're further back and aren't involved and in, aren't as close to the fight and can't see what they see. Why are they going to take notice of you if you're not bringing anything? You as a commander have to be bringing something to the equation that means that they are going to listen to your commands. <laughs> right then. <laughs> Back in a second. Today has been a lot of iron brew. I've got to stop booby trapping that sort of that, that position for myself. Okay. Hmm. Right then. Hmm. Hello. Help, Sean Mac. Hello, Sean Mac. Uh, Let's see. <laughs> sure, Mac. It's bizarre local interference. Hi, Command. But this happens every time. Gun crew. We're well, well, sorry for the breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. And... 
Gary Southey, Squad Sergeant Thomas of Durant, a number one Durant of number one commander, an ML three hundred six, was recommended for the VC by the commander of Jaguar, though it was a Lewis, not a twenty millimeter. The other non officer VC was Able Seaman Savage of the two pounder on Campbelltown. At least I think it was Camden, a two pounder anyway. Possibly that, or well, the other one which was carrying a two pounder would have been the MT MGB um, Fair Mile C. MGB M MGB three one four, I think of where she was. From memory, Kahaman. If dog boats had poles on board, I reckon they would signal to German vessels we are poles. Uh, I think they had a few. I think. I'm not sure if the Polish Navy, uh, Free Polish, did get a dog boat, but I'm not surprised they did. Right. So, on to the Battle of Ushant and Action Off, or Action Off Hildebas. Now, I always, I'm covering this before I talk about some of the D Day preparations and some of those things because it's such a cool battle. Mark Palthman, hello from Hong Kong at 3M. Keep up the good work, Alex. Thank you, Mark. Trent Lenko, hello. USN had a problem with IJN, IJA suicide boats at the end of World War II. Everyone has a problem with suicide boats. That's so annoying. You don't have enough dog boats to deal with them. All right, so this battle took place whilst the Allies were still getting ashore, very much still getting ashore. Uh, it was not fun at all for the Germans. And it was not really far. The, the British would have liked to have um, taken out far more of them, but they did quite well. Trent Hogan, this is how Prof. Donald Cresson described the USN solution. The matter of surface suicide boats in order to require a little beyond uh, headway, vigilance, and automatic cannon. It works. So, the German force, the 8th Zustora Flotilla, comprised three destroyers. Um, Zastora is the German for destroyer flotilla, basically. Uh, comprised three destroyers, Z-24, Z-32, which are two 1936A Narvik class vessels, and a captured Dutch destroyer, the Gerard Kallenberger, renamed uh, ZH-1, and a single torpedo boat, an Elbing class destroyer size vessel, that's T-24. The Elbing class are the sort of... <sighs> what in any other navy would have been called a destroyer, but in the German navy were called torpedo boats. The trouble is for the Germans is that the British hear them coming. And when I say they hear them coming, Enigma hears them coming. And Headache hears them coming. Now, Headache is one of my favorite systems of World War II. And it's one of the ones which is least talked about, but they get so much intelligence of it. The Germans are chatty on the radio, okay? The, G the British are quite chatty as well on occasion on the radio, so the British can't, don't have anything to stand on. But the Germans are very, very chatty on the radio. So chatty that pretty much every ship in the Royal Navy which is going into the Channel or anywhere uh, has this system installed. If they are big enough to install it, they have it. It's called Headache, and it listens to their communications. And quite a lot of them have German speakers aboard, whose job is to basically listen into the headache and go, Sir, they're saying this. Okay, right then. It sometimes works rather too well. <laughs> when I say works rather too well, there are occasions when the Germans are actually maneuvering in harbour, and they can hear them so clearly they think they are maneuvering right close to them. Uh, and are going to attack. And one of the problems with this is the Germans don't seem to understand the power control button on their radios. They transmit at full blast all the time. They're basically like me when I'm when I'm lecturing. I am full volume 100% of the time. They are full volume 100% of the time, it seems. And this means that the British are regularly sort of listening to them. And... Um, The Germans were, you know, chatting away. And you therefore have a scenario where British land units are able to listen into this conversation. British sea units are able to listen into these conversations. And they therefore get a, quite a lot of information about what the German boats are doing. Ah. 
Sean Mack has just written, the Germans were bad at that. <sighs> MCOM. Yeah, they were. They were bad. And so this allows Admiral Latham to sort of basically organize what is a trap. The first thing they do is they withdraw what had been the target for the destroyer flotilla, one of the primary targets of the sort of flotilla, which was the anti submarine warfare patrols, which were in the area, which would be <coughs> keeping the submarines back. And basically, what happens is these, but uh, there's a swap over. Tent flotilla had been behind these patrols, ready to support them if they got attacked suddenly but leaving them to focus on the anti-submarine warfare operations. And, oh, the Germans are coming. Hello, we're Tent Flotilla. We're here to deal with all your nightly destroy German destroyer needs. We have a nice welcoming carpet of pretty much every single tribal class destroyer in the Royal Navy Royal and Royal Canadian Navy at this, at this precise moment. Plus, as added bonus, we bring Poles a lot on the Free Polish Navy. So, aren't you going to be happy? Don't you wish you had friends like me and us? And this is how the battle goes. So, at 0114 hours on the 9th of June, Tata's Type 276 uh, radar, which has a, P a PPI indicator, Space contact bearing 241 degrees at 10 miles range. In contrast to this, the Germans get very, very limited warning from their radars. And they basically know something, something around, but they don't know where it is. They don't know what it is. And it's only thanks to the moonlight they actually see, <gasps> they're British destroyers. And they basically go, ooh. It keep right in, launch torpedoes, and about turn and run. That's their plan. There's a small trouble for this. The front leading division is the 19th division, and each flotilla is divided on two divisions of four ships. So 10th flotilla is divided between the 19th and 20th division. And then the, the front 19th division are, instead of the traditional British pra practice of being line astern, which 20th were in because they hadn't yet got as comfortable with night operations and using radar to position themselves at night as the 19th Division, which been doing this longer. 19th Division are line abreast. So that means that even if you do hit one of them with a torpedo, you're not going to probably hit the rest, and they're going to keep on coming. And they actually managed to avoid the torpedoes quite well. And so they keep coming. Now, before we get into action, there's some questions coming, so I'm just going to quickly deal with them. That's good. That's like, you'd think they'd have learned the don't use radio at max power lesson after World War I. Uh, no. Carmen, you don't wish you had friends like me. It makes me think you, you got a friend in me. Uh, that's from, I, I feel some ships should have come with warning. Caution may contain the free Polish forces for any, any enemy nearby. It's not necessarily the best night to be the free Polish, but we'll leave that to one side. So, um, The trouble is for the Germans is that by actually turning around, by actually firing their torpedoes and turning, they lose speed, which allows the, te uh, the destroyers of the tent floats here, especially 19th, who are cracking up every single uh, uh, horsepower they can get, as are the 20th, to get as close as they freaking can, are just racing up. And. This means that the attack team starts to break out. So you have Z-32 angles north. It doesn't really complete its turn and goes north to the waiting embrace of 20th Division. They're waiting to say, hello. Hello, we're Polish. You're Z-32. Um, that's one of the two type 1936 uh, A Narvik class vessels. And... Um, Ashanti and Tata have ZH1 and Z24 to themselves. 
Hello. Now, um, the Z32 managed to actually get away from 20th Division. Basically, because they're in line astern, they don't cover as much of an area, so it managed to skirt round them. But it does get a bit of a mauling from them. Still, I do give the captain credit for getting away from the Free Polish Navy. And he then managed to use this getting away to actually do something which the Royal Navy had been proud of by trying to surprise Tata. Scores some hits and then disappears into the smoke he cre he's, he's creating. Unfortunately, though, ZH1 gets confused by the smoke which Z32 has been producing, comes out of it straight into the waiting, loving arms of Asante, Tata, all their guns. And Asante's torpedoes. Asante fires two. Just to go. Hello! And both hit. So, unsurprisingly, ZH1, after being fit, hit by two torpedoes, uh, roughly 150 rounds of 4.7 inch ammunition, is pretty much at point blank range at night, is pretty much turned into a burning hulk. Um, I can't see how that would have happened. <sighs> All right. <laughs> now, south of this, Z24 and T24 were... Well, these are the two vessels which actually get away, but they were having the undivided and warm embracing attention of HMCS Haida and HMCS Huron, who were treating them to some very special Canadian hospitality for being at sea. They, they, they felt they were reserved, deserved to be rewarded with being at sea by having as much ammunition as they could thrown at them. 4-inch, 4.7-inch, mm, uh, every cannon machine gun. I think there is even one example. Uh, there is one claim on Hyder that they got close enough that at one point that two of the officers were firing their pistols at the enemy ship. Uh, the, the, the point is, everything that could be being fired is being fired at these vessels. They limp into... A British minefield and managed to get away that way, which causes Admiral Ramsey and Admiral Latham to um, curse, scream, holler, shout, and probably tear some poor officer who was in charge of planning a minefield and a new one in various levels. <laughs> uh, Albazowski, fun fact ZH1 is ex Dutch destroyer Gerard Calamber. I think I did say that at the beginning, but yes, it's a Dutch destroyer. Uh, quite a lot. This is the other thing you have to remember that sometimes the British were dealing with not German designs, but German captured units, which were Dutch, French, Belgium, Danish, all sorts of things. <sighs> Right then. So, now, Z24 and T24 got away, but um, despite escaping death by tribal three times in one night, Z32 had not been blessed by the Asante tribe. Initially, both sides think they are part of... Uh, so she approaches HMCS Haida and Huron. Initially, both sides think the, others are, the other is a part of their force. However, the Canadians become suspicious for quicker. This is so unusual. No one expects the Canadians to become suspicious more quickly. The Canadians are such nice people. They're such friendly people. Opening fire with Starshell from their X-mounts, blazing 4.7-inch from A&B at the same time so as to both dazzle and destroy the Germans, the German destroyer again takes refuge inside a British minefield. However, this time, thanks to 
the fact it's far enough away from the coast and they're able to get their radar position, uh, radar working just right, they manage to track it from outside the minefield. So they skirt round the minefield while it's going through. And when it comes out the other side at 0444 hours, going very slowly because it's damaged, uh, <laughs> they open fire with everything they've got. I mean, they literally turn... Beam on. So all four turrets on both vessels can fire and blast away. For some reason, the German destroyer captain decides that he's being engaged by cruisers, of which the only four turreted cruisers which the Royal Navy has operating in the area are town-class cruisers. So I I I'm sorry, that they're a bit bigger than the tribals, but that's what he's deciding he's being attacked by. And decides that he's, or possibly he thought he was dealing with an hour fuser, I suppose, and was missing turrets on both of them, but I don't know. Uh, and um, decides that, uh, rather like Narvik, uh, he's on fire, his ship is sinking, he's going to beach himself. And so he does. At 0513 hours, he beaches his ship, and that's out of war. Uh, honestly, Z24 and T24 don't have much of a war after this as well. They also got quite um, heavily damaged. So, honestly, it was uh, a, a very interesting night for the Royal Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy. The Polish Navy were very, very frustrated. And interesting enough, within about a week of that occurrence, I can point to the 20th flotilla a 20th division of the 10th flotilla, being able to do abreast night operations, uh, which would suggest that their divisional commander spent basically the next seven days, 24 hours a day, practicing it until they could do it blindfold with possibly his gun to their head. Uh, and that particular commander was... Um, Nemenetsky of Blazakia, which I probably just mangled. And let's see what the questions are. Come the tribal should, and for the matter, any allied group of ships of a larger number in combat, blast, don't you wish a friend in me, and you've got a friend in me to annoy the enemy? Probably. The squad, uh, thank you, not the ships, a Polish artillery unit had a bear as a mascot. It Copied men and carried some of the shells from the trucks to the guns. Wojcik the bear. I'm scared of him sometimes. Wasn't he made a sergeant to get from Africa to Italy? Ah, yes, he was. That was good. I added that in. D just Shomak, the Germans operated some flowers, right? Yes, they did. I believe the Canadian pistol champion is at 75 yards. Might be wrong when you're saying. <laughs> uh... Danny Freeman, ah, angry Canadians. I'm guessing Huron and Haida were told the German ships had said ice skating was clearly just dancing on ice. <laughs> Something. Uh, that's good. Uh, apparently, it was any animal wasn't allowed on the ship. I, I, I don't think that the Poles were the only unit to commission their mascots into their respective armies, but I take your point. Um, Jemak, how to pronounce Blasia? It's something like Buesvatsia, Svatsa. Buesvatsat? Gavitsa? This is where I need my girlfriend here. I really do need her. She, she's good at languages. She's brilliant at that. Right. So, D Day. What were the dog boats up to on D Day? Well, even on the first night on landing, the 6th of June, when a major assault might have been expected, the attacks didn't come in. So let's go read on some of the rest of this from page 161 and 162. Because I think you're going to enjoy this account. I love this book. It's not very expensive. I think it's on my Amazon affiliates list down below. And yes, I do now have that because I decided it would help people try and find the books. So, on the next night, there were seven contacts, two of which were by the dog boats, both on the eastern flank. Once again, Bradford and 55th Flotilla featured. 
In the same position as the previous night, a few miles uh, west of Le Havre, Bradford sighted an Elbing class destroyer followed by two Moes. And it seemed that they were stalking yet another ship to north. When a star shell was fired, this turned out to be a British corvette escorting a convoy, and Bradford saw his chance when the enemy's attention was diverted and went in to attack. One torpedo hit on a Mo was seen and confirmed later by intelligence reports, and the other enemy ships returned to Le Havre, towing it back. Further east, in mid-channel, five boats of the 59th Flotilla from Dover, led by Dennis Mason, were vectored to a group of four e-boats from Boulogne. They attacked and claimed to have damaged one. They were sent on to another group and fought a brief action. Reports indicate later that, that later Typhoon aircraft sank one e-boat and, managed, and damaged others. The level of activity and the importance attached to the maintenance of the constant patrols on each side of the main supply route is graphically illustrated in the following quotation from the privately published memoirs of Lieutenant A.H. Lewis. Arthur Lewis was CEO of 705 in the 59th Flotilla at Dover. Operating this time out of New Haven, and from the first night was allocated a patrol area within a 20-mile grid square on the chart to the north of Camp de Dante. He writes, and I have looked up this book. I'm trying to track it down to see if I can buy it. Um, it sounds sort of... It's, it seems an interesting... Thing. All right, MTB705 sustained quite serious damage and casualties in a conflict V-boats. The casualties were transferred to a frigate with a medical team board. On return to New Haven, and New Haven, I expected the repairs to take several days, but as soon as we got alongside, the boat was besieged by about 40 shipwrights, ordnance officers, and mechanics. In no time, they're putting everything to rights, including an enormous tingle uh, over a... Tingle is a temporary repair over a, uh, over a hole in the hull, commonly using a thin sheet of copper over a large hole in the boat's side, and the installation of a completely new 0.5-inch power turret. At the same time, replacements and injured crew members were coming aboard with their kit bags. All the repairs were completed, the boat refueled and ammunition topped up by late afternoon, and by 1800 we were off again to our box off the French coast. That sort of preparation is why, prior to D-Day, you have some holes in the field. And some holes in the fence. Right. John South. I think it was Atrus Majestic that had a pet elephant. Hmm. Alzaski. In Polish, general is that all letters are pronounced except Dizzy, Sizi, Zezi, and a lie, uh, like, which are considered as a single letter. Hmm. Uh, there should be a link in the description of the Amazon affiliate link. Um, why do we know attacks D Day? I'm going to guess dog boats had a roll in. Um, basically, the Germans were still recovering from various other attacks. And this is the point the British chose when they were going to attack. The Germans had been trying operations elsewhere and had been getting beaten up by destroyers and things. They did manage to get some attacks in during D Day, but they didn't manage to get anywhere near like enough. And they were mostly R boats. Um, none of the e-boats or Schnell boats got involved. And when the Schnell boats start turning up, the e-boat, well, they get bushwhacked quite often. The English language looks at such rules and laughs while quietly wondering what a rule is and why you would follow one. Uh, interesting. The dog boats and an awful lot of fighter bombers flying over the channel. Something like 40,000 sorties flown on D-Day by 14,000 Allied aircraft against 350-ish German aircraft. Yeah, it was... Um, it, there was a lot of... Uh, basically, the Allies poured everything into making sure there was nothing there. He also some comments that are uh, reading on from the earlier thing by um, Lieutenant L H. Lewis. He also comments that on the following night, 705 was again in action... And one of the replacements, an 18-year-old ordinary seaman, his first trip to sea, was wounded. Such was the pace of operations at this momentous time. A 55th divided into three units of four, and each given a different task, have already been mentioned as being in action on D plus one and D plus two. Bradford's own unit had actually been in the van the whole approach, screening the minesweepers as they led the cruisers and destroyers of Force J into the bombardment positions on 5th or 6th of June, and being astonished to discover that they had no surface action to fight. Thereafter, his unit had remained in the assault area, taking on supplies from HMS Cellar, and trying to get some opportunity for the watch off to have some sleep. The nights were spent on patrol or in action, always close to the minefields, even in daytime. 
There was a general rule that no one stayed below whenever the boats moved, except, of course, the engine room crews, the telegraphers and radar operators, as the threat of mines was always present. Bradford describes how the crews were exhausted after four, uh, after four continuous days and nights at this high state of tension and alertness, and how his own unit of two boats was relieved on the fourth day for a return to Dolphin for rest period. His third unit took over, but he stayed a further day to show the newly arrived boats the ropes. The second unit of the 55th, left by, led by, half lead, uh, by the half-leader, Lieutenant W.S. Biscuits Strang, had been in action on night of D plus three and had a harrowing patrol compounded by the obvious problems of ship recognition in such a crowded area. Strang was ordered to sink what was believed to be a stopped e-boat, but at the critical moment it switched on recognition lights and proved to be a uh, motor launch. A little later... There was more confusion between the duty destroyer division and three enemy ships in Elbing and two Moes. Although this confusion destroyed any chance of attack, it at least prevented any danger to the anchorage as the enemy were turned back to Le Havre. In this vital area between Le Havre and the anchorage, there was cut activity. The 50 night flotilla from Dover and units of the 55th, closer to the assault area, together with the 29th short boat flotilla, were each in action on almost every night of the first week. Their officers were acknowledged by Admiral Sir Philip Vian. The naval commander who signalled, The coastal forces operating in the eastern Tarfels area are doing fine work. MTBs have intercepted each night. It is largely due to them that the assault area has been enjoying immunity from surface attack. The motor launches have performed an essential, if less spectacular, task. The 55th MTB flotilla under Lieutenant Commander Bradford have particularly distinguished themselves. You have destroyers, you have motor torpedo boats, you have enough out there. Um, B, though, B, uh, BW like whiskey, B, we, Yaiska, VC, ah, B, we, yeah, B, we, ska, V, la, hmm. Keep trying it, but we'll, we'll get on to steam gunboats. I can pronounce their names. Their names are pretty darn cool. I do like the grey boats. They are SGB one and SGB two are from Forningcroft were cancelled in Worcester, but SGB three becomes Grey Seal. SGB four becomes Grey Fox. SGB five becomes Grey Owl. SGB six becomes Grey Shark. Uh, SGB-7 is sunk before she gets given a name. SGB-8 becomes Grey Wolf. And SGB-9 becomes Grey Goose. And it's Grey Goose, which is currently a houseboat moored at Who St. Werberg. So if anyone has any uh, pictures or any idea where um, Grey Goose... Any no knows where Grey Goose is... It'd be really nice. It, it, sort of, it'd be really nice to see what state she's in now. If that doesn't interfere with someone who lives there, you know, if there's someone, I, I don't want to interfere in someone's private house or anything. I'm just really interested to see what she looks like as a houseboat, because Grey Goose is rather a cool-looking ship. In fact, I have a picture of her. That I can bring up and will bring up. Grey Goose, Grey Goose. This is Grey Goose in her war form. And I think they look very cool little ships. You don't associate something moving so fast with a steamboat, a ship vessel. But this was a steam gunboat, and look at her racing along. You can also see that she has really quite a different weapons fit from the other class, which is uh, which I was got pictured up there, which is HMS Grey Fox. So you have Grey Fox, and you have. <laughs> You have Grey Fox and you have Grey Goose sitting there, and you can really see the differences in their looks at the, and you know how they differed in terms of weapons fit, and they were all modified quite heavily during the operations. 
Grisarski, you're getting better with each attempt. Thank you. Uh, Don Fritz. Hello, Donald. Uh, did the Germans, Allies, use or experiment with rec uh, recoilless rifles like the Russians did with small surface vessels? They did, but they had other things which worked fine. So, you know, that's the thing. Carl uh, Harmon, excuse the silly question. What's the difference between an e-boat and an R-boat? They're different types. The e-boats were usually refers to Schnell boots. Um, the R-boats refers to... Let me just get up the class. The R boat tends to refer to the Achrombot in German, meaning minesweepers. And uh, they were used for minesweeping, but they were also used for attack ships and various other roles. They, there's a fair number of them again built. They range from 60 to 160 tons in their weights, because there's a fair number of different classes built. Some sh uh, some ships are built very small, some built uh, ships are built far bigger, and, you know, they are a common vessel, which you do have going around here. Mostly they're armed with uh, another 37 millimeter cannon, flat cannon, some 20 millimeter cannon, some machine guns, mines, depth charges, those sort of things. They are some of them are converted to torpedo boats. Uh, plus, they use vessels uh, which are our boat is often also designates vessels which are captured from France, from Netherlands, even some British vessels, um, some Fairmile Bs, which were captured, I think, are designated our boats. So, honestly, our boat can mean a lot of things, and you can never be quite sure which one you're talking about, unless you can dr drive, dive down on really on which photo it was. Descott, I wonder if allies were flying aircraft with radar and ley lights, usually used against U-boats. They would probably work just fine against E-boats. Aircraft able to ID target two. Yeah, they did have a few of those up there. Mm. Thank you, the steam gunners always sound nice, but I shudder at the idea of boilers being penetrated with all the fast-moving explosive things in the small boat action. Yeah, but there is a reason they weigh at 250. They, they displace 175 tons in standard. Those boilers have some protection. Jerison, at who you say? There's a Vosper 73 powerhouse boat for sale there, too. Goodness gracious me, someone's lucky down there. Hmm. Right. Really, Poles and using handguns in naval context. The captain of the SMS uh, Schaffer was a Polish officer, uh, Bogomil Nordry. Uh, uh, looked him up in Wiki and Drakenfell's bombardment of an uh, and I can, uh, a Kona video. Hmm. Uh, Martin Dock, fair male dock boats and steam gunboats needed for Caribbean guard ship, jib squadron in the Gulf. Hmm. Eric Arkin, captured trawlers, small vessels were also used in patrolling the occupied coastal area, uh, called uh, Volpelsfruit. Could be armed, converted trawlers. I'm, uh, I've been diving on one, still had mines. Ooch. I wouldn't want to go near that then. Uh, underwater, gem mines. Whoosh. Yeah, I'll probably upload short sound clips of me pronouncing some Polish names. That'd be very helpful. Donald Fritz, what forms of protection did these ships offer? Could the hull stop a 20 millimeter and was the armor just one area or spread out? Small ships like BT boats, or small, bo uh, small Chanel boats, or the BT boats, uh, they don't have any armor, pretty much. They Some of the British... The Brit uh, D boats did have some armoring in terms of some areas were protected, but not much. The steam gun boats had more. So, here's the summary while we're here. So the answer to torpedo boats turned out to be rapid-firing guns. So it's the same problem. You see, this is the thing. When people start going, oh, the E-boats, the Schnell boats, they're new, they're this thing which really revolutionizes World War II, and you sort of go, no, they don't. They just don't. They're, 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 they're good, but they're not going to revolutionize it because... It's been dealt with before. Torpedo boats have been dealt with before. They have been part of the lexicon for a long time. 
the Royal Navy has worked out. You develop the Torpedo Boat Destroyer. Now the Torpedo Boat Destroyer has evolved into Destroyer, which has evolved into other drops. It's got the anti-aircraft mission. It's got the anti-submarine mission. It's also got the anti-surface mission. So it's a far bigger vessel. But you still need to deal with the Torpedo Boats. So, hello, motor gunboat. Because we can't call something a Torpedo Boat Destroyer again. And that's basically what they're building. They are building a modern Torpedo Boat Destroyer for World War II. That's what the D-Class are. Jack, on Discord. Thank you. Carl Harmon, a fluffy research assistant request is walk. Yes, I do know that is coming. So I, that's why I'm also getting a summary. And I'm going to say uh, 10 more minutes for roughly questions. And then I'm going to have to go because fluffy research assistant is starting to wolf quite loudly. Craig Shasta's key. Uh, you could offer to partner with Drak and do one like his guide to Japanese names. Hmm. If Jermac did that, that would be quite cool. Don't forget, so basically, if you're getting shot at, the only remedy or, or, high, uh, or only hide is to shoot the thing shooting at you, making him stop. Yes, pretty much. You maneuver as fast as you can, you fire as quickly as you can, and you take them out. Which is why radar produces such a decisive advantage. Because if there isn't much in the way of armor or protection, then, frankly, if you see the enemy first, you're going to fire first. If you fire first, you're going to win. Carl Gansman, I'm sure it was 9mm, only 50 rounds of handgun ammunition. Could be Stair M191 from a stop, Ras Gans, Revolver, even Broom Handle, see, or combination. Mm. It's, these are very fun ships. These are very interesting ships. They don't bring anything new to the war. But they do bring a capability which the British have to adapt to and British have to respect. And they are very dangerous. As I said in the part one introduction, 40% of British shipping losses are in waters around the coast to mines, aircraft, and e-boats. That's scary. That's a lot of losses, especially early on in the war. The British get better at beating them, but the reason the British get better at beating them isn't because it's a new technology. It's because the British get more boats. It's once the motor. It's the same as with the flower class corvettes and the river class frigates and all these vessels coming online. Once you get sufficient escorts, you can do the job. You have the tactics. You have the doctrine. Andrew Lambert said this quite clearly in his in the Admirals of Bilge Pump. But it's it's there and other things. You have the tactics. You have the doctrine. The difference is you need to have the ships to be able to actually implement it. And with the fall of France, the number of ships you need is that much greater. Fall of Norway, the number of ships you need is that much greater. And that's the thing that happens to the British in World War II. It's that they are looking at a war in 1942 with certain nations still in the war as either neutrals or an ally. And then they lose them. And suddenly the requirements for ships going up there and they still have got their ships at about this level of numbers. And so they have to build up to get up to that. And they do get up to that, but it takes time. It, it can't, it's not going to happen quickly. And the fact is they do that while still fighting the war and still staying in the war. And that's really quite cool. Shomak, people say e-boat was revolutionary. That's just something I haven't heard before. You'd be amazed at some of the things I have found doing the research and looking into this one. And some of the things people have gone on with the e-boat. Oh, the diesel engines, the this, the that. And it's not revolutionary. It's not. Oh. Most sensible ones don't. Donna Fritz, damn, these boats seem like a death trap, especially on the German Japanese side. They're, for all sides, they're not really that great. Come on, nothing new, but a lot of old experience lessons? Yes. <laughs> Danny Freeman, the boat war, or little boat wars always seem more like aircraft dogfighting than battleships slugging out. That is very true. It's high speed turns, it's maneuvering for impact, it's if you get the shots in first, you can do a lot of damage. Because, like aircraft, they don't have the staying power, they don't have the armor to take the hit and carry on hitting. It's kind of like, if you consider the ranges they're often engaging at, you know, there was one point at which, well, one, which was the book I read it in. 
I think it's in this one. One of the captains, of, well, one of the lieutenants in charge of a dog boat, um, says that state that his average engagement range he preferred was no more than thirty feet. If you can get that close, do it. Ghost House, get down a fast, wooden, little armor, machine guns, fight or uh, uh, light auto cannon, aircraft engines, and aviation gasoline. Yeah, definitely aircraft. Uh, Dev Squad, uh, did the Japanese make use of MTB, MGBs? I thought they preferred using small destroyers. I think they did have some things along those lines. Carl Harmon, in many ways, I think MTBs are the fighters of the sea, and their pilots may have the, may have been decent um, decent motor torpedo boat crews. Hmm. Hmm. Don't know, Fritz, last one for me. Would you consider the Pegasus Hydrofoil ship the ty uh, type, the natural progression of the small PT boat? It is to an extent in that it's trying to, it's using, it's taking the planing techniques as far as they can go naturally. But I would say the trouble is it's more a progression of the Schnell boat than the dog boat. In that the whole point about the dog boat is it was, yes, fast enough, but it was also strong enough to carry a lot more weaponry and be very adaptable. Whereas the hydrofoil is a very complicated vessel to start putting weight on around on. Carl Gasman, that's good. Actually, yes, I said uh, Schaffensrut went into the inner harbour bow first, uh, but was charged by Italian infantry in the 30 millimeter wide channel. That's why using handguns. That would seem sensible to me. Angus Sonos, sail close to the enemy, for I wish to smite them with my sword. Well, you might as well. That's good. That's a flock. From what you were saying earlier, they're also engaging in the fighter plane style of ambush and run fights. Yes. Carl Hanman, Angus, I have a knife <laughs> which is the front enemy close the right. <laughs> there are lots of... These attacks, these operations are very much about getting as close to the enemy as you can, and that's important, because again, you're going to do most damage as close as you can. Because you have radar guiding you where, telling you where the enemy are, but you often don't have radar guided weapons. Uh, you might have some indicator system set up, you might shouting angles out and these sort of things. But the closer you get, the more likely you are hit, especially at night. Right then, uh, I'm going to say thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you, as always, for all the questions. Thank you to everyone who is a Discord member. Thank you to everyone who's a Patreon member. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed and who has pressed the little bell. And thank you to everyone just for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. I will, as always, update the timings on this a little bit later. And thank you, everyone. I'm off to now to walk a puppy dog before he mutinies on me. And before you think he wouldn't, he, he would. If you, if you thought he could get away with it, he would mutiny on me. If you thought it would get him more biscuits. I love that dog, but I do know he mutiny. Anyway, thank you very much, Carl Harmon, Daniel Freeman. Thank you, Donald Fritz, Sean Mack, Greg Slowowski, Carl Von Gasberg, Angus Sonnel. Thank you, Jack Hunter. Thank you, Old Richard. Haven't seen you before this evening. Thank you, Carl Harmon, I think I've said. Uh, Martin Doc, thank you very much. Hope you have a lovely evening. Jay Rison, thank you. Take care. Um, let's see. Trent Talanko, thank you. Sean Mack, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Derp Squad, thank you very much. Iskandatab, thank you very much. Um, let's see, we also had Dunrick Ironhammer, thank you. Night Hammer Production, thank you. Lionheart X-Ray, thank you. Hope you have a nice evening, all of you. Uh... <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Let's see. Have I got everyone? Martin Doc, I think I've said thank you. If anyone I've missed, I do apologize. John South. I think there's at least one people I was missing, but I think there's others as well. Thank you. Uh, Mark Palfman, hello and thank you. Hope, you. hope you're okay in Hong Kong. Albert Zaski, thank you very much. Felix B, night, night. Eric Aken, night. Thank you very much. Lucia Buddha, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Dirk Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Loki, uh, Loki392. Good night.